Senator Melissa Hurtado, you are a current state senator. You are running for the 22nd Congressional District. Thank you so much for joining us in studio today. Thank you for the invitation. Senator, let's get started with the basics. I mean, why are you running for Congress? Your term for, for the state Senate ends in 26, but you're eyeing Congress now. What inspired that decision? Well, look, I think that there's very much like the city of Bakersfield, there's a sound of something better. Uh, there's a sound of something better in terms of this race. Um, there's a lot of challenges that uh, lie ahead. The challenges that lie ahead and the current challenges that we face are not the challenges of yesterday that we're mm -hmm. familiar with. They're, ver they're very much different. And I think that in my humble opinion, there's a huge uh, gap uh, missing between the federal government and the state government and the local government and the sharing of information, right? And if we, o if we want to overcome the challenges that we're facing at the moment, there has to be better um, information sharing along those pathways. And so um, you need a leader that, that understands the issues, that understands the challenges, and understands the importance of how much more connected we, we really have to be to c overcome those challenges. And I don't really see that in any of the candidates that are running uh, today. So that's why I decided to enter into the race. Tell us a bit more specifically about those disconnects that you see and how you as a leader in Congress are able to address them. Look, I, for example, just uh, the level of information that is gathered at the state, right? Um, you know, one of the things that I'll be working as a state senator right now is introduci introducing a bill that um, will notify lobbyists in state if they're working um, for a, a entity that's out from outside the United States. Mm -hmm. There's a federal law, FARA, which requires similarly to do the same. You have to disclose it, but um, you know, I, I feel there's a gap in that information. Uh, it seems like there's, there's a need to be able to um, make sure that that local lobbyists have the knowledge to report that kind of thing. Otherwise, uh, there's just a gap in the information that, that, um, that we all need to be aware of. And going again to your decision to run for Congress, mm -hmm. uh, I reported in the past that you had um, a push of sorts from Emily's list um, that ultimately got you thinking, okay, should I, should I try for Congress? Should I try running against your Democratic opponent, Rudy Salas? Um, can we talk a bit more about that push and that kind of evidence you saw that you had a legitimate chance against your Democratic opponent? Well, first and foremost, uh, running for, for Congress is, uh, it's not about winning or losing. It's about this congressional district, this region, the needs of it, the challenges that we face, what and how it plugs into the national conversation. Uh, it, and that's really what this congressional race is, is uh, it should be all about. That's what it is for me. And so uh, first and foremost, that's what's most important. But when it comes to um, uh, my Democratic challenger, I'll say that uh, in my reelection for state Senate, I did outperform the current, uh, the other Democratic candidate in this race by uh, quite a margin. We're going to get a bit more into the political aspects of the right. campaign later, but uh, let's talk about you know what you've done so far as a state senator. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you feel has been your biggest accomplishment and kind of that proof of what you've delivered here for Central Valley residents? So what I'll, my biggest, I'd say, uh, victory, and I take a lot of, I'm just very proud of this, is uh, being able to deliver um, funding for water. And, uh, and I have to say the other big one is uh, funding for public safety. And I wanna talk a little bit about why. So when I first got into the state Senate, I ran SB 559. Uh, there was a lot of, I, I don't believe that people uh, felt that I had a chance at winning, yet I beat the odds, I won the primary, I won the general election. And when I got to the Senate, I, I wanted people to really understand that I am here to represent the people of the Senate District and that it wasn't just one party or the other party, it, it, was, it was addressing the issues that, that we all have. So I did that by taking on water, worked with uh, stakeholders, with farmers, 
uh, with a lot of different community members throughout the Senate district and we drafted a bill that would fund the fr fixing the Frank Kern Canal, which we know that Kern County is, uh, receives, uh, and actually the congressional district as well, receives a lot of the water that comes from the Frank Kern Canal, both for our farmers and for our communities. And so it, it was a real challenge because there was a lot of uh, misunderstanding of in Sacramento about what the bill would do and why it was needed. And so it just felt like it was something that we would never get. And it took, uh, it you know, first time it got to the um, governor's desk and, and it was vetoed, we brought it back and then it was held in, I believe in the appropriations uh, committee on the assembly side. I mean, there was all these challenges, but we didn't give up and we worked together uh, as, a, as, a, as a region, as a, as a community to fight for that funding that we needed. I even partnered up with, you know, Congressman Jim Costa and uh, then uh, State Sen uh, Senator uh, Dianne Feinstein. And so there was a, it's re it was really a partnership to try to be able to deliver w uh, money to fix these canals that would create additional water for our communities and for our farmers and for the economic vi vitality of the, of the region. And we secured $200 million. I'm very much proud of that. And the same goes for public safety. We introduced legislation. We pushed and asked for money for uh, our communities to receive a funding for uh, police departments, uh, for fire departments. And it was a really challenge. It was a huge challenge at first because uh, there, was a r uh, there was an anti-police uh, uh, sentiment going around in the Capitol at that time. And so to get funding for it was a real challenge, but we kept on pushing and we've been able to, I've been able to deliver for uh, this region quite a bit when it comes to public safety infrastructure. Going more into the specifics yeah. of that, what I've seen is that, you know, your campaign was able to acquire $465 million from the state budget for a variety of projects here. The 200 million you mentioned for water, is that part of that 465 million or is that separate? I'm mean, to be honest to say that I've lost track <laughs> in terms of how much money, it's a large amount and mm -hmm. probably more than that, but yeah, $200 million alone. And, it, and the $200 million, it's already been dispersed. Uh, it's amazing to go back and be able to drive through the part that has, uh, where, where the subsidence issue is on the Frank Kern Canal. And then now see that, that it's being repaired, it's gonna be, that it's being fixed, it's amazing. And also to see the workers, there's workers from Bakersfield that are working to fix this Frank Kern Canal. So it's just amazing the level, uh, just what $200 million to these investment projects, what it does for a community, for a region, and especially in water since we know we, we need it. And uh, so I've lost track at this point to answer your question, but it, it, I would say that it's gone beyond that. And that's just, that's just one major, um, the 200 million is just one piece. There's also the annual $130 for the safe and affordable drinking water. That's something also that I'm very proud of because originally <laughs> I've even been quoted on it and, and at first being in opposition to it. Why, why was I in opposition? I was in opposition because it would tax disadvantaged communities in the state of California without really knowing if we were going to benefit from those funds. So I was very much against it and it was hard to be against it because of course it's something that, it's a value that I share that I, that I wanna get money for our communities to address uh, our, our water, our safe drinking water issues that we have. But I didn't want them to be taxed and I didn't want them to be in jeopardy of not having access to those dollars when they need it the most. And sure enough, being vocal about it, we negotiated, the, ultimately there wasn't a tax involved. And that's the kind of, that's the kind of leader I think that you know, people in the congressional district deserve. That's the kind of leader that I'll be. I'm not gonna be afraid to, to stand up when something is wrong. And, and at the end of the day, be an effective leader because that's equally important. Being effective for this region is, is what we need and the challenges and the, and the types of challenges that we're, that we're facing now and moving forward. And I feel like I should also note right after this interview, you're gonna be presenting a check to the McFarland Police Station. So I wanna ask Senator, how do you determine which police station, fire station, communities get the funding that you have already secure? How do you decide kind of what gets prioritized here? 
That's a great question. It, and so what we, what my team and I do every year is that we reach out to all the, all the CAOs for the counties, we reach out to the city uh, managers, and we do a press release and we say, hey, um, if you have a bill idea or a budget uh, need, please um, get it in, and this is a way to get it in. So on our website, we have a form, you fill it out, and then we give a deadline for when you have to submit it. Then we have a process internally where we go through it, um, and then we we ask for it all as or as much as we can. And based on the you know what's going on in Sacramento, uh, we you know solidify uh, the 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 budget um, what what we're going to prioritize. And so we've been really focused on public safety right now because the time is right. Uh, it, it it's it's no longer a difficult time to to secure funds for public safety, and so we've been very much focused on that. We started off with water at first, public safety now, and we've been able to deliver at, at least uh, $65 million throughout the region for public safety uh, needs. And so there is a process. I welcome the community to, to be part of that process. I want them to be part of it. Um, that's what being a state representative is all about. That's what being a representative is all about, right? Is making sure that you take the needs of your community, that you listen to them, and that you put them into action. Like you said, a lot of community input. How is that all gonna work when you go to that federal level, to Congress? So what are your top three priorities when you're uh, a Congress member? Well, look, it's very much the same. I wanna be able to continue to deliver for the, for the communities of, of, of the Senate district, of the region, of the congressional district, and uh, the issues that I'm working on at the moment, uh, making sure that we protect agricultural farmland, making sure that we protect and, and be able to provide jobs in the community, uh, continuing to provide infrastructure investments for critical infrastructure specifically, I think is just big. Um, I think that there is a big shift in migration that is occurring and we're seeing here in the Central Valley where um, people from outside of the Central Valley are moving into the Central Valley, into Bakersfield, uh, but we're at capacity. We're really at capacity in terms of our, our roadways, in terms of our, our water infrastructure and our, ener and our energy infrastructure. And so in, to be able to grow and grow in a safe way, we gotta be able to have those investments. Investments that we put into uh, the Senate District have come a long way. We've been behind in terms of investments uh, but we're, we, I feel like we're at a point where we've caught up. Obviously, there's always uh, room for, uh, for additional investment. There's always needs. But I think we're also hitting a point where we're going to continue to see population uh, uh, growth in, in the region, and we've got to be able to be prepared for it. Do we have um, you know, adequate space in, ho in hospitals and emergency service? Do we have enough firefighters? Do we have enough paramedics? Do we have... There's critical infrastructure that we've got to be able to be uh, prepared for, to, for, that, for that level of population growth. Otherwise, we're going to see uh, uh, things we don't want to see. And so that's a big part of my focus and making sure that uh, this region has, that this congressional district has a voice in everything that is being negotiated at the federal level. So those are your priorities for Congress Absolutely. as well. Okay. Yes. I think the reality of the situation though, Senator, is that even now from, from half uh, or across the nation, we see Congress kind yeah. of in gridlock when it comes to a lot of these decisions, a lot of partisan divides, specifically on border security, mm -hmm. for instance. So you have these local focuses, but I think the reality is when you go to Congress, yeah. you might not be able to focus on the district on a daily basis, right? You might have to tackle issues like the national debt or, mm -hmm. or border security, immigration. So what do you tell voters who are worried? Okay, she has this focus for our, for our district, yeah. but she could be swept away by the politics of Capitol Hill. I mean, I, I, I really do believe that it, at the end of the day, it's all about the congressional district, right? Immigration is impacting this con congressional district, whether we recognize it or not, it is. Uh, it, the debt, the national debt, is impacting this congressional district, as is the, 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 the situation that we're in budget deficit with the state. And you've got to be able to have that local perspective 
because if you have that national perspective, then it, it look, it, being a, a, a U.S. representative, it's about going to Washington, D.C., and being able to uplift the voices of this region and their concerns and how the national conversation impacts the local conversation. And really, it should be the other way around. We need to be able to have influence on that national conversation because if we don't, then we get left behind and we are impacted in ways that we don't want to be impacted. And so uh, I, 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 I feel that, uh, and my focus would be prioritizing the needs of this region, uh, this congressional district, in terms of what the conversations that are going on at the national level. I don't want to get into the, the politics of the Republicans this or the Democrats that. Uh, we're all Americans and we all want to live and accomplish the American dream. Why is it so difficult to get things done that are going to benefit all Americans? So what's your pitch as to why you were the best candidate? Right, because your three opponents in this pool are saying the same thing. I prioritize the district. I'm going to represent the Central Valley up in Congress. But yeah. what are some specific proposals or, or thoughts you have in mind as to why, how you would tackle those issues specifically to benefit people here? Look, it's, it's the reason why I'm different is because I've, I've demonstrated that already uh, during my work in the state senate. I've been able to work across party, you know, the party lines. I don't like to get into the party or the partisan politics because that's that's not America. America is about prosperity and um, living in, in in thriving communities. And and so the difference between me and, and the other candidates is that I'm thinking about the today, the tomorrow, and uh, I'm leading. I'm actually leading, right? And uh, again, sometimes it's difficult to take to take that um, that tough stance on whatever issue, but you got to be able to do it for your district. Uh, even 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 if it backfires, you can't be afraid to lose an election. I, I I jumped into this election very much like I did in 2018 when I ran for state senate, knowing that I could very well lose. You just I don't know, right? And you can't be afraid to lose. You always have to put the, the interest of the American people, of the people of this uh, congressional district, first and foremost. You've got to be a leader that thinks ahead, right? And that is acting with the, the that is acting with addressing the issues of today, but of tomorrow as well. Uh, and I, I just don't I don't see that in the in the candidates uh, uh, that are currently running for this congressional district. I see a lot of bickering back and forth. Uh, I've looked, I've had the opportunity to work with uh, both the Congress member and, and, and the former assembly member. And uh, I, 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 I just know that, um, I, I know that I could be a better, I can be a better representative. There's a sound of something better <laughs> in this congressional race and I believe that it is me and that's the pitch that I'm making to uh, the congressional district. Is there an example of you having shown in the past that you're not scared to go beyond party expectations? I know you said you yeah. don't like the partisan politics of it all, but because you do identify as a Democrat, is there an example perhaps in the way you voted, for example, that you showed, sure, I'm a Democrat, but I put my district first. It doesn't matter that I'm a Democrat. I'm not scared to vote against a Democratic proposal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, look, it just securing money for public safety funds. I've been asking for it for quite some time. And yeah, I've, yeah there was at times that, um, many times where uh, standing up and asking for this money was a tough thing in itself. But I've said, you know what, this, we need public safety. Public safety is the foundation of a democracy. People um, want to feel safe in their community. They want to be able to thrive. And if we don't put money into this, then essentially we're saying like we don't care about democracy, we don't care about uh, freedom, uh, and 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 that's it, it was a difficult thing to a difficult conversation to have, but I did it because I know that the importance of it and the need that we had in this community, and now the conversation is changing, and that's why it's so important to have leaders that are not that are afraid to 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 stand up and speak their district, speak what their district is saying because. I feel at least my district has never led me wrong. 
I've um, spoken up and took the, the hard positions uh, when it was necessary, and I've done it. Uh, it's it's led me in the right path, and I and I you know will continue to do that. So uh, just want to make sure that I I reaffirm that to the to the constituents and the importance of being a leader, and 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 sometimes you'll be alone, but the but. The fact is that that's how conversations and how things are changed. If you're afraid to, s to, to stand up and say something, then it's, it's not going to change. You're going to have status quo, and that's what the uh, people of this congressional district don't want. And again, I want to get into that term independent Democrat that, that you've used in the past. You and I have talked about it. And last time in a statement, you told me basically the definition of that is that uh, you're not going to let partisan politics get in the way of your lawmaking, of your of your leadership to your people. But right. can we just tackle the definition of independent Democrat more? What does that allow you to do in terms of, again, exceeding or going beyond yeah. what the party asks of you or, or demands uh, of you? Well, it, look, I don't think that there's an exact definition. I think for me, uh, when I when I s when I said that, it was basically saying that um, that I've always been just an independent, uh, uh, just thoughtful and policy maker, and that's what leaders should be doing, regardless of. what I mean, I don't, I don't really like the titles at times, but uh, it just. Again, just being a leader, I, that's, that's really essentially what I was trying to say is that, again, why do we have to get into the, into the titles of independent Democrat or independent Republican or it, it's just doing what is good for people uh, and not being afraid to stand up and be that leader that you were elected to do, th to be for, th for the district that you're looking to re represent or, or have been representing. And I, I have stood up and been a leader uh, as, the only Democrat uh, in, in voting on, on difficult issues, voting you know no or, or not voting with my party. But sometimes I've been the only Democrat, <laughs> the only the only state senator voting uh, against everybody else. Just this past uh, legislative session, there was a, a proposal that I just didn't agree with, and I was the only state senator that didn't vote for it. Everybody else, Republican and Democrat, voted for it. I didn't vote for it. That's the kind of leader I think um, that this congressional uh, district wants and deserves. And, and why, why is that important? Well, it's important because um, it, it, it starts uh, asking, it, colleagues begin to ask the question, well, why did, why did she vote no on that? Everybody else voted yes. What was wrong with that bill? And that's exactly the type of conversation that I want to stir not just in the state legislature, but in Congress as well. Which proposal was that, Senator? It had to do something with veterinarians, and you know, we there's a uh, I don't know exactly. It wasn't my bill, <laughs> but uh, it, there was just some issue about how medication is prescribed, and with you know fentanyl on the rise, and uh, there was there's some other type of drug, and that um, that we're just increasingly concerned about, and. That's that's why I um, I didn't vote for the bill, and it was I think the right thing to do. And, and it, you know the the conversation is starting to uh, start up again, and so perhaps hopefully soon I'll begin. To, I'll also have the ability to have a hearing on it, so people can understand why uh, that's such an an important uh, topic, but also how it plays into the situation that we're seeing with with drugs and overdoses in our communities. And the reason I emphasize the term independent Democrat so much is yeah. because your Democratic opponent, Rudy Solis, yeah. as you know, has, has gotten the, essentially the nationwide support of, of the Democratic yeah. Party, locally, statewide, again, nationwide. And so some cause for concern there is if he has this many high profile endorsements, you know, is he kind of bound to party expectations? And so I wanted to ask if your use of the term independent Democrat was perhaps a, a take on on your Democratic opponent and perhaps what he may be limited uh, in his abilities to do with those endorsements? I think that's a question that he has to answer. But what about for you? What do you make of the, those endorsements in terms of, d or, or do you think you have more freedom to, again, go beyond what the party asks of you or go beyond what high profile people in your party would expect of you? I do, I do believe I have more freedom. I do, and, and uh, again, it, 
I can't speak for him or you know his position in terms of how that all plays out, but I I I think that's some will some will see it as a challenge to be honest with you that okay, well she's she's just an independent thinker. No, I'm being a leader. That's what leaders do. They stand up, they speak out. Sometimes you're not going to agree with them, sometimes you will, but sometimes it's important to be heard, right? And 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 to see the opinion from from a different angle. And it may change your opinion as well. And that's what creates change. And so, again, if you may be party bound, uh, I, I, I mean, I would expect, you know, uh, the, the, the representative for this congressional, congressional district to be that kind of leader. That's the kind of leader that I would, that I expect to have, right? It's someone that is going to uh, critically think about issues that is going to voice those concerns. And it doesn't matter if they're the only ones that are speaking uh, ag against that issue, but that they do it in a way that is going to create more discussion. It's going to create an, an, uh, positive change. And I don't see that in either of the candidates. And so I, I, I do believe that perhaps both are party bound. And we only have about five minutes, Senator. So I just yeah. want to very quickly touch on two more things. Again, your Democratic opponent, what he's really campaigning off is minimum wage and overtime, how he helped guarantee those, especially for farm workers. Right. He also talks about how avid of a supporter he is when it comes to abortion. Let's quickly touch on those issues. Minimum wage, overtime for farm workers. Where do you stand on that? What have you done for, for that population? Well, look, when the minimum wage law passed in the, in the legislature, I wasn't in, in the legislature at that time. But what I'll tell you, just based on what I'm observing in the community, is that the overtime wage law for farm workers, they're losing hours. They're struggling. They're, 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 some of them are losing their jobs. It did more harm than good. It did more harm than good. And, and the agricultural community warned, warned the author of, of those potential issues down the road. And exactly, that's exactly what is going on. That is exactly what is going on. I mean, we know uh, very well that there was funding that went to farm workers to help them out. There was a whole, there was lines. There was lines of farm workers uh, waiting because they had lost hours or they lost their job. Um, and I mean, with the way that things are going here in the Central Valley, with land fallowing, with the water issues that, that we're continuing to see, it's, it's, um, it's, they're the most disadvantaged in all of this. And I haven't been afraid to talk about that. I'm not gonna, it, it sounds, uh, look, there's policies and laws out there that sound good, but when they play out, they're not good for people. And I've, I've been that kind of policy maker in the legislature that hasn't been afraid to say, I'm, I, I want to do better for farm workers, we need to do better for farm workers, but this policy or this legislation is not it. And I've introduced legislation to, to go about it in, different, in, in, a, in a different way to actually support farm workers and not hurt them. And so I just don't know, I, I mean, I just don't think it's playing well out in the community when you're saying I work, I've fought for overtime pay for farm workers and farm workers are losing their hours and their jobs. Last thing for me and last thing control room. Yeah. Uh, I want to touch on oil and energy. I know you've, you've said, you know, you support that transition to clean energy, but you can't just get rid of small businesses. You have to help with that transition. So how would you fight for Kern's <laughs> oil and energy industry when you are up in Congress? Look, there are three important things. When we, when we talk about uh, climate change that we've got to be talking about, and we've got to be talking about them together. They can't, we can't be talking them separately because they, they, they align and we know that here in the Central Valley. Water, food, and energy. We have to think about it in that context. Uh, and when, it when we talk about climate change and, and a transition, I don't know if we're going to be ab ever able to have a, a just transition. There's just too many challenges uh, ahead. I don't know if, if we can really overcome them unless we drastically change things. I do believe that we've got to have all tools on the table when it comes to energy. Uh, if we don't have all tools on the table, then we are not energy secure. And that I think is, we need to be energy secure. We need to be, we can't be picking once, again, it's like party, par partisan politics. Like 
we we really got to have all the options on the table and um if that means we've got to continue to have uh, oil then that i think that's part of the conversation that's part of what we need to have to be energy secure and so long as we we can't we're not energy secure without that then um i just i i just disagree with uh, whatever's out there and you've accepted money from oil, from the oil industry what is your response to recent critiques and billboard critiques that you've you've done that i mean it's this is kern county we're one of the largest oil producers in the nation uh money has never influenced me uh it's it's why i feel so proud of how i got to the state senate and honestly it's really rewarding to know that i'm I'm a congressional candidate, but I'm not uh, bound by uh, big interest or or uh, big money. I'm just I'm I'm going to my voters. I'm going to the, the people that know the work that I've done, that know my character, and that's how we're running this campaign. And if they give me the blessing and allow me the opportunity to continue to move forward in the primary. I think it's it's going to be the greatest blessing ever, right? Uh, moving forward, knowing that it was the voters that pushed me across and not big money. Senator Hurtado, thank you so much for your thank time you. today. We appreciate you joining us. Of course.